You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. This is the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. Welcome to show number 66 for September 2018. And for you hockey fans, that's Mary Lemieux's number. Should we speak in French for this one? No. No. I'm your host, John Costage, somewhere near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And joining me via Skype from their respective locations is uh, Harold and Michael. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey. Good evening. That's true. It is a special evening recording. As you're listening to the show, you might want to lower the lights down. Our guest this month is Dan Greck of The Road Chose Me. He is overlanding through Africa, and we talked with him while he had a decent Wi-Fi signal in Malawi. He had the one good connection available in that country. (laughs) I think you're right. (laughs) means nothing else there would work during that time. A very special thank you to our Patreon patrons. Your support really does help us out. It supports our domain management, website hosting, and uh, possibly some other things down the road. Uh, Over the last month, we've added three fine enthusiasts to the show and have become patrons. So a big thank you to Dan, Terry, and David. Dan, in fact, signed up 10 minutes before we start to record the show. So, Dan, uh, I need your address. I'll send you a sticker. If you want to become a Patreon subscriber, go to patreon.com slash center steer for all the details. And also, thank you for your comments, likes, follows on the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagrams, and the emails. We received a follow-up email from Matt in Washington State. When we last left you, uh, Matt, had e- <laughs> Matt had emailed us about uh, him uh, driving his LR3, and he followed up with, uh, I listened to the last episode of the podcast. I want to thank you for reading my email on the last episode. Quite a thrill. Thank you for sending the stickers. I got them, so no worries. I also wanted to report that uh, me, my wife, and our two girls just returned from our trip through Central Oregon, 170 unpaved miles through the high desert and forests. It was beautiful, and the R- LR3 handled it well. Disco 3 for those of you in the rest of the world. Everything from well-graded gravel to some downright nasty rock crawling. Took it all in stride, not to mention comfort. Hope all is well with you guys. Keep up the good work, and I'll keep listening. So that little knob in his console got a workout then. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, unless he did it manually. Because can't you, you can... Does that one have... Um, yeah, I got the, I got the reference. Uh, does that one have... Uh, automatic uh, or the lr3s didn't you had to select uh, the right you have, to, you have to select the terrain via the the knob and congratulations to our three winners of our wilkes toast giveaway it was our way to celebrate the 70th anniversary of land rover and thanking the wilkes brothers chip won and asked for and got the snx891 mugs and stickers so i sent those off and chris and Derek won a one-year subscription to Alloy and Grit magazine. Thanks to our friends, of course, at Alloy and Grit for their participation. And thanks to our winners. And now the news for September 2018. August worldwide sales figures announced by Jaguar Land Rover. So retail sales were up in the UK, 60, almost 65%. Overseas markets were up 20%, and North America was up 2.5%. Europe was slightly below at 3.1%. The China market remained remains unsettled following tariff changes and tension trade tensions. They were down 38%. I'm reading your article, Michael. Hope that's okay. Of course. <laughs> it's great. He'll, he'll send you the bill later. That's right. It'll be about $57. Abs- there you go. Hey, perfect. Uh, JLR August total s- retail sales Uh, Units was 36,629. Roughly a third of that was Jaguar and two thirds of that was Land Rover. The year on year change overall was down for the company 4.9%. Land Rover was down almost 10%, but Jaguar was up 7.7%. That was August. That was August to August. I guess things have kind of moderated. I know the sales have been down a bit. Uh, in the last couple months, but it was good to see the UK seems to have rebounded. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit uneven and rocky, as you'll get to later, but it's interesting to see. I always like ha- how, seeing how they can spin it each month. <laughs> well, things were going like gangbusters for, what, about two or three years? I mean, uh, well, actually, what, five years? Almost every time on the podcast we talk about it, every time when sales are up, sales are up, sales are up, sales are up, and then finally they've they've taken a little downturn. And, uh, yeah, well, everybody wants like Apple sales numbers. They want everything to always be up, and it's like that's 
not really possible. No. Well, specifically, as you said, next story here, JLR to cut output at the UK car plant after warnings on Brexit and diesel. So said it will go down to a three-day work week at the Castle Bromwich plant in central England just days after its boss warned about the impact of Brexit and diesel policy on manufacturing. The Castle Bromwich facility will operate a three-day work week from October until the beginning of December in a move which will affect around 1,000 staff but avoid job cuts, a spokesman said. Quote, in light of the continuing headwinds impacting the car industry, we are making some temporary adjustments to our production schedules at Castle Bromwich. Week, the firm's boss, uh, Ralph Spaeth, warned that the wrong Brexit deal could cost tens of thousands of car jobs and risk production at the firm, especially if there are delays at ports and on motorways due to customs checks. And finally here, he also, uh, he also said that the government had demonized diesel cars on kind of an opposite uh, view here. Conservative lawmaker and Brexit supporter Bernard Jenkins accused Spaeth of making it up when he asked about the automotive boss's comments, which included a warning that it was already more attractive to build cars abroad with Brexit adding uncertainty. Well, the interesting thing is that you know, a few days later after that, uh, many who have the plan in Oxford did a variation of the same thing. They're going totally offline for a month. Uh, so instead of like as a work slowdown of three day work week, they're just closing for a month. And again, citing Brexit uncertainties and what's going to happen and and whether or not, you know, that's a normally slow time and retooling time anyway, but whether or not it's all Brexit or diesel or our companies trying to put the fear into the populace by slowing things down or who knows what it is, but uh, it does show some awareness of some slowdowns in sales. I definitely think that the the Brexit and Land Rover's expansion, well, JLR's expansion, to they're pushing as well. It is another story coming up too, where they're they're trying to push to build one hundred thousand cars a year, and I think that expansion, and then having problems at home, is certainly causing them problems. But at the same time, them expanding, and getting out of the UK, was also a smart move to diversify their production capability. Yeah, they've always looked at that type of thing, and other companies are looking at that. I mean, that, of course, I mean that's why we have so many non-US companies building cars in the US and US companies building cars overseas. It's just that whole globalization. Well, and diversification worried about trade tariffs and, and production issues and things like that. Well, yeah. it, allows, it allows you to hedge your bets with, with currency exchange and, and also, you know, it, it pays to build your product in the market you're going to sell it because overseas uh, shipping of the cars is expensive. Yeah, everything from, from the suppliers of the components to the end destination of the cars, you kind of want to figure out the the most direct route for all of that. Right, and minimize the amount of shipping you're doing. Exactly, yeah. Speaking of uh, moving production and changing production, JLR will commence production in Nitra in the coming weeks. So the British car maker will begin making cars in Nitra in Slovakia in the next few weeks, announced uh, JLR Slovakia operations manager. Quote, uh, we started building the factory almost exactly two years ago. And today we are looking at a factory that is nearly finished. At the moment, we are working very hard on the latest preparations to pr start production. We will start shipping cars to our customers at the end of the year, unquote. At present, Jaguar, uh, Jaguar, well, it should be JLR, Jaguar Land Rover employs more than 1,300 people in Nitra, of whom 97% are Slovaks and three-quarters of them from the region. Uh, JLR will make 150,000 cars per year in Nitra. The Discovery will be the first model to roll off the factory's production line. The production of one car takes four days. I think it's the same, yeah, same gentleman quote. Apart from the Land Rover Discovery model, we will later produce another model but I can't specify which for now. Dun, dun, dun. Un unquote. <laughs> the plant should have about 2,800 employees by 2020. We'll get into another article about the Defender later, but I'm pretty sure it seems that the Defender will be produced in the Slovakia plant. Well, I think it's going to be everything that's not Range Rover. Well, in a way, it would make sense to be whatever it is to share the same platform so they didn't have multiple platforms at a factory. Right. Well, except that the Evoke and the Disco Sport share the same same platform. Yeah. So, uh, former Land Rover designer Phil Simmons joins Great Wall. Great Wall is China's largest manufacturer of crossovers and SUVs. 
And it has a brand called Havel, H-A-V-A-L. I assume it's Havel. They started that in 2013. So Phil Simmons will be the design director for the Havel brand. He will lead the design studio at the headquarters in the north China city of Baoding, as well as... So de- design director and a Chinese automaker is pretty much the, the chief of, of design theft, isn't it? Copyright infringement? I, that's that's not here in the article. Okay, so. just checking. <laughs> He previously was the studio director for Land Rover's exterior design and responsible for the creation of the 2018 Range Rover, the Range Rover Sport, the 2017 Velar, as well as the 2016 Evoque, Discovery, and Disco Sport. So exterior design and responsible for the creation. So what did Jerry do? Uh Yeah, I thought all those were Jerry's. To be sure, we've heard... Jerry's the mouthpiece. He's the guy that takes credit for all the other guys actually doing the work. It's it is a team concept. I mean, it's not you know it's it's definitely not well. But but that one says responsible for the design. You know, it's always like took part in the designs. One thing responsible for it, I would have thought would have been Jerry. Well, ultimately, Jerry is responsible. I, I, you know, it's 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 like any other organization that has you know directors, managers, and a team. That's the same thing. But it's 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 interesting how you look at somebody's resume and they'll say responsible for, and you know, yet it was a team effort. There were a bunch of people. Ultimately, someone's heads on the block, right? For if it goes well or doesn't go well. Yeah, well, but usually they fire an un- underling at least for a while. Well, as long as you got some red shirts, you can dispense it. Exactly. <laughs> Next story, Tata, uh, an automotive brand that is best known to the United States for the Tata Nano, uh, is going to build an Indian-based SUV based on the Discovery Sport. Obviously, we know that Tata owns uh, Land Rover and Jaguar, but they're going to use the Disco Sport as the basis for the upcoming Tata Harrier. That's the name of that vehicle. The Harrier will take the slot of their premium SUV offering, but it won't be a direct copy of similar Land Rover models. There will be a five and seven seat model like the Disco Sport. A Fiat two liter diesel engine is rumored with all wheel drive and a Hyundai gearbox. The vehicle will have its own styling interior deriving, uh, uh, sorry, it will have its own styling and interior deriving from the latest Tata design themes. It won't be seen, we won't be seeing the uh, Harrier in the U.S., and sales I should really what take off. I wonder what his vertical performance will be. So there we I get a lift out of stories like that. <laughs> you got? Is there more? Should I wait? Is there anything else? No, nah, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Next up from Artnet.com, Land, Rover design, Land Rover's design director, Jerry McGovern, on the artistry that fuels his award-winning vehicles. Not a lot that's new here. We've heard a lot of, these, a lot of this before about modernity and minimalism and things like that. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. If you want to check that out, you can. They they do the question and answer uh, situation again, like we had uh, Alloy and Grit did. But a couple things to point out here. What kind of art forms or fields of aesthetic endeavor do you look to for inspiration when creating a new car design? And Jerry replies, car design is a very particular discipline, and I don't necessarily take inspiration from other things, certainly not consciously anyway. Because the inspiration comes from within. It comes from the brand. It comes from looking forward. It comes from a little bit of looking back. I'm pausing there on purpose. Design, in my view, has some fundamental principles. It has to have good volume and proportions. It has to have good balance. I suppose that the biggest influence of my car design would be the modernist approach, the misin. Did I say that right? Misin? Reductive, less is more approach to design. I just interesting how he uh, says looking, you know, it comes from looking back or a little bit of looking back, maybe not a lot. So maybe he'll only look back five or 10 years, not 65. Or he so. will not look back farther than the oldest thing he designed for the company. I was about to say that, yeah, that puts him squarely looking at his own stuff. Or he looks back and says, okay, I don't want to do that again. Well, see, his stuff's the only stuff worth looking at. So that's all he is going to look at. Yeah. How important is style and design to Land Rover's overall image and raison d'etre as compared to things like utility and performance? How do you balance the two? Jerry says, if you'd have asked these questions to design leader at Land Rover maybe 30 years ago, they'd have said, well, we're a functional brand. It's about our engineering, functionality, durability, and all those things. To me, it's far more than that. One of the things we have managed to do over the last 10 years or so is make a design to, to make design a fundamental part of our business. Design is at the core of everything we do. We live in a world now where image is everything. Uh, once things become comparable between one manufacturer and another, 
whether it's technology, quality, precision, reliability, connectivity, whatever it is, the, once those things become comparable, what are you left with? You're really left with a brand and its essence. It's design. It's the design that communicates what the essence is. I get that. I can't remember the last time Jerry said something new. I mean, it's like the same shit he says every time, just you know, he rearranges the words a little bit. When I read this, I, I know what you're saying, Harold, but when I, when I read this and I look at it, it seems like he's talking in circles <laughs> because he's saying on, on the one hand, he's saying th- that you need to be design is critical and important. It's the only thing that there is and things are comparable. And the way I look at it, all the designs now look look alike, not only within the brand, but without the brand. If you, you know, right. Dodge, I see Dodges on the road here in the U.S. That, that I'm like, is that a Disco 5 or not? I don't know. And it, it can be very confusing. So it almost seems like he's, again, talking in circles. You're saying you're doing this, but you're really not doing it in my mind. I think yeah. the brand distinctiveness isn't there. He, yeah, he, should, he, design, should be, he should run for office because he's talking like a politician. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, he, I think his he he thinks he stresses design and he might, but it's kind of like I once uh, heard someone talking about car design with wind tunnels is that if everything is optimized for the wind tunnel, everything will look the same in the end. Yes. And it's kind of like what he's done is it all kind of is going the same direction. So maybe he's designing it. But there's no branding in that design. That's interesting. And the branding is, I think, very subtle. It's in, it's in the front, in the, the front and the bonnet. He's certainly changed individual branding when what it used to be from Disco Fives in the rear. They had vertical tail lights, and that was kind of distinctive. And they had and even the bump in the in the roof the of a Disco. The now they say it's still there, but you got to get a micrometer out to see that it's there. I mean, right. I've seen, we have a lot of, actually, it's amazing. Uh, they must be selling pretty well because we have a lot of Disco 5s uh, around where I live. And the worst thing I can say about them is it. I don't realize they're Disco 5s. I kind of do a double take when I figure out, oh, that is one, because I thought it was a Ford. But that's been Jerry's forte, is making Land Rovers look like Fords. That's what he's good at. Since 2013. There you go. There's your new slogan. Making Land Rovers look like Fords. So next question was, how do you see car design evolving over the next decade? Uh, I'm not going to read every one, but he pulls out some interesting things to consider. Electrification. Uh, what is the what is going to be the optimal propulsion system? Autonomous driving. What uh, What's that going to mean the way you design cars, particularly our interiors? The world of connectivity, how well connected do we actually want to be? The whole issue of car ownership, when we move away from people owning individual pieces of mobility to shared mobility. We have been able to find our way on embracing that in a way that allows us to continue to produce vehicles that resonate with people on an emotional level. I do think that design will become even more prominent in terms of brand differentiation. Resonate on an emotional level. That little phrase comes out. Every time he opens his mouth, and, say something new, Jerry, or, or get off your damn soapbox. Although I find that the current, well, not the current, the the seventy year run, nearly seventy year run of the series and Defender, to me was in fact a design that evoked at an emotional level for you. It does. Now to me. I, w- I was looking for a good time to bring this up, and that's as good as any. I got in the mail yesterday actually a a brochure from land rover going come see what we're doing become again part of the land rover family because they don't realize i have one sitting in the driveway and all and the picture on the cover of the brochure was a defender there you go i mean that it floored me when i got it that here's your new welcome and see what the future is bringing and everything else and you put out on the front of the brochure a car i can't buy for Something they don't make anymore. Exactly. That's the problem. That's their, went, their biggest icon, and they killed it. Right. And they're and from what he says, they're not planning on even doing sort of homage to it. So, I mean, again, I'm still hoping the best for it, and I hope the best for Land Rover, and I love my Discovery that's sitting out there that needs an oil seal. But <laughs> it's like your 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 marketing people don't even believe what's coming out of your mouth. Did this come from the local dealership, or did it come from... Uh, no, it came from... North America. Yeah, North, North America. America. Okay. That's interesting. See, that's interesting. Well, that probably indicates that... 
well, I don't know what that indicates. Maybe that maybe they're not communicating well with the home office. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Well, obviously, I mean, it was a very, very nice, heavy, slick brochure. It was not a cheapy. So, I mean, but it really it kind of floored me. I expected a Disco Five to be on the front of it, or at least something of a Velar or something. Of something the new. new cur- yeah, the new current line. Something I can walk in there right now and go. Let me test drive that. Instead of oh that's nice, let me go hit bring a trailer or wherever, and I'll see if I can find one. Right now, again, they are about to start doing some other stuff here with the classics, but that's not even what he's saying he wants to do. This is a bit becoming the grumpy old man show. So I'm sorry no, about that, but it's, it's like it's just kind of frustrating. I you you I think you are enunciating something that others think also. I'm not, that brochure led me to believe there are people inside their company who believe that. Yes, that's probably a good. That's probably a one. That is probably an indication of what that is. There are some. There are folks there that, hey, hey, the defender is the thing. Or, or maybe you could say there are the people. Since this is a North American uh, marketing uh, collateral, that that people in North America have a better clue the direction the company should be going than the people in England. Which is scary. Yeah. I mean, it is the most recognizable icon. And, yeah. And, and there's something to be said for the fact that it's not been available here for sale, really, for 20 years. And yet they put it on the cover to say, to hold that up. You know, they, they don't like talking about a lot of the past models, especially since Defender until now because of reliability issues. They went well, so far as to change the name so that you wouldn't think that the, of those vehicles, the, the Disco 2 and the Freelander and such. That's interesting that then they, then they, so what do they do? They jump back 20 years to say, hey, look, here's you know, Defender, even though you, as we said, you can't get one. But right. I'm confused. the vast majority of the American populace, you know, unlike, people who listen to our show that have a clue, you know, they don't know Land Rover that well. So when when these people who don't know Land Rover hear the name Land Rover, what picture comes into their head? The Defender slash Series. When I tell people that I drive a Land Rover, they immediately think Marlon Perkins. Yeah. They think, you know, they think Series. I'm like, well, I used to, but no, no. And then I, the, and then they start going, oh, you mean a Range Rover? It's like, no, there's a Land Rovers? What are, they don't even know Yes, that the right. new Land Rovers exist, and a lot of people don't. Yeah, well, they they lost a handle on that one. That's definitely the case. Yeah. A JLR Rover Classic brings modern infotainment to classic cars. So the new range of classic infotainment systems provides modern audio, navigation, infotainment functionality for all classic cars with discreet and harmonious styling. Compatible with negative earth vehicles, classic infotainment system range in is available five designs, including two Jaguar, two Land Rover brand units. Touchscreen classic infotainment system features include DAB, FM, AM radio customizable navigation, satellite navigation, and Bluetooth. Last one, premium sound design from single DIN head unit with a built-in 4x45 watt output. Buy them today for $2 million. Roughly, yeah. Yeah, these um, they look nice, and they they do have a retro feel and fit, but, man, the price. What was the what was the price, Michael, you were telling me earlier? It was about $1,200, not including installation. Yeah, that I'm sounds about right. About try, uh, yeah, that but it was right. like... And I looked at it, and I'm like, really? They're not, again, sound grumpy. They're not that special. You can buy classic retro radios that you can also get in positive ground, so it'll work in some of my cars, um, <laughs> for a lot less. Yep. that are actually nicer. I mean, right. I, I was a little bit taken aback by that one. It's I really a- expected them. I, I mean, it would be great if they were really, really top of the top of the top of the line, You'd go, okay, but they're they, just kind of okay. I have to think these things are super cheap to build because they you know, they use knobs and they have some push buttons that and it looks retro in a in, you know retro nicely done. Uh, at least the couple pictures I saw, they look nicely done. They would fit in with the time of the, of your vehicle. Well, they do. You can buy them right now. I, I know people who have them in in MGBs and everything else, and they cost less than half that. Yeah. Right. You open up a, uh, an issue of Hemmings, and there's at least a half a right. dozen advertisers in there selling those stuff. And, and, they're, and, and they're nice. They're fine. There's nothing at all wrong with them for less than half the price. Actually, you, know, you can even do it cheaper than that. You can put in any modern, regular stereo that you want, and then you go out to the, to the yard sale and you buy a radio of that vintage that looks old and clapped out. And then you bandsaw the front off of it, and then you just set it on the dash in front of the other one while you're parked. A buddy of mine did that with a it had a had an old eight track cartridge sticking out the front of it, and he glued it all together, and he'd set it on there. And nobody ever tried to steal the stereo. Yeah, well, a lot of people, yeah, you know, some of the old ones for the '60s 
70, even early 70s vintage cars, or those things are getting expensive these days, the old BLMC, to try to find them. But what if people work, do yeah. is even if even if they don't work, they get them and put them in, and then the modern one goes in the glove compartment. Yeah. I've or these days when you can do everything Bluetooth, you don't even need to have a, a head at all. You just yeah, it's hook un, under the up. seat or somewhere, yeah. Right, and then you just hook it up, and then the, the nice old one sits there. Now, it will not pass when I test it at the Concourse this coming weekend, because I will make you turn on your radio, but oh. it looks good. Oh. Well, if you it sounds this to me like uh, JLR is just kind of trying to cash in on that space. They're trying to probably, if they can get some money. Well, they've got something that, you know, new, their new facility in Savannah, that that's gonna you know the the classic they're gonna redo cars they can sell people that to put in their Jaguar E type that they're having Jaguar restore nice little upsell exactly so moving on to some specific upcoming model news the updated Disco Sport will arrive towards the end of 2019 with a new infotainment tech and a hybrid model in 2020 since the introduction in 2015 the model has overtaken the Range Rover Evoque to become the British 4x4's brand's top seller with 119,000 units sold globally during 17-18 uh, financial year and over 300,000 in total, which seems quite a lot. This goes Sport will have a modified version of the D8 platform, and it looks to be created to accommodate electrification. Of course, you know, uh, on 2020, that's when electrification is supposed to happen for all vehicles. The Disco Sport, though, won't change much in profile or design. The article here from Auto Express expects only minor changes, such as new headlights, taillights, and a new front grille inspired by the newer, larger Discovery. And their spy photographer managed to get a brief glimpse in the cabin, uh, where some more interesting changes are found. The cabin will be updated. A new central console infotainment system can be seen. But it confirms that the Disco Sport won't get Touch Pro Dual Duo dual screen infotainment setup equipped on the new Range Rover line models. So new updated Disco Sport coming. That's cool. Yeah. And also a new updated Range Rover Evoque is coming, very similar as we just uh, ma managed. Land Rover is going to maintain the trademark styling with distinctive sloping roof line and the high shoulders. The new model will get a cleaner look that borrows cues from the larger Velar, including a set of pop-out door handles, better integrated bumpers, sleeker front and rear tail lights. Uh, it'll be on the revised current D8 architecture, which was the same architecture used by the Disco Sport. The updated platform uh, should help improve ride quality and comfort, and they're, and they're hoping that it's going to get some rear passenger space. A new dashboard is expected to make use of the brand's latest technologies, including Touch Pro Duo infotainment system that combines two touchscreen displays. So I think that's going to be a big difference between the Disco Sport and the Evoque is the infotainment system. There we go. I, I like what you said about they're hoping it will actually have some rear space. Yes. That's, yeah, that's some right. rear space. Not more, but just some. <laughs> Uh, Land Rover is expected to reveal the new Evoque towards the end of the year with sales in Europe set to begin in 2019. So on YouTube, Car Wow, W-O-W, -W, did a nice review, I think, of the Range Rover Sport 20 for 2019. Uh, it was nice. It was even handed. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. We're not going to watch it. It's 18 minutes. But if you want to check it out, we'll have a link in the show notes. And if you want to see what the what the what what's going well and maybe not so well with the 2019 uh, Range Rover Sport, you want to go check that out. It's a, it, was a, it was a good video, good review. And then there was a some information came out, I think, uh, subtly about the new Defender and Autocar and Atlantic British both kind of pulled some things together. So I'm going to read a bit of the Atlantic British one uh, article, and it's entitled Some Reasons Why We Haven't Seen the New Defender Yet. And this kind of puts some things together that was revealed, I think, at a JLR corporate, one of those corporate calls where they talk about the what's happening with the company more on the business side. There, there's like five headings. The first one is Land Rover doesn't do concept cars anymore. So you may recall, as, as Harold indicated, about the Chinese stealing designs. And I think that's one of the reasons, I think even McGovern had said this, that since uh, the, the when that, was it the Land Win came out? Yeah. Uh, that has kind of put Land Rover off uh, exposing any of their design concepts so they don't get stolen. Probably why we haven't seen a design since the original DC concept. The uh, the factory isn't ready yet. Uh, as we talked earlier about the Slovakia plant, it seems that's where the new Defender is going to be built. And as we heard, they're going to start with a Disco 5 first. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they're waiting maybe to start building and revealing a new Defender is they're not ready to build it yet at the new factory. Maybe they're waiting for the 
Disco 5 to be sort out some issues and concerns since that'll be, you know, why start two new vehicles at a new plant? Maybe you can, you know, and whatever problems you need to work out, it might be easier to start with one vehicle at a new plant, work those out, and then add a second vehicle. At least that would well, be really, all they have to do is modify the tooling to fit a different skin on the yeah. same vehicle. And I've never seen a company not announce a vehicle just because a plant wasn't ready yet. I mean, in fact, JLR has done that before and go, look at what we're going to build at this plant we're going to build over there. That one's that was kind of iffy to me. And this was nice because the, the Atlantic British article here pulled together that the famous Load Lane factory in Sully Hall will only build the Range Rover, Range Rover Sport, the Velar, and the Jag F-Pace. The Disco Sport and the Evoque are made at the Hellwood plant close to Liverpool. And then so that will then have the Disco 5 being built in Slovakia, and most likely they're going to build a Defender now in Slovakia. Mm -hmm. The platform is all new. We had talked about this, I believe, last month about the Modular Longitudinal Architecture, MLA. And so there, and there was a, what, another one? A, is it PTLA, I think, is the other one? And so this is going to be built on this new, uh, new uh, modular longitudinal <laughs> architecture. And it's going to be one of the first vehicles to use that. And because that is supposed to underpin every vehicle starting in 2024. Again, you have new, you know, you have new facility, a new design, you have new, a new platform. Uh, these are things that are thinking as to maybe why there's a, there's a, hasn't been revealed yet. In addition to, they went back to the drawing board. We know the DC 100 concept was pretty much uh, panned when it first came out. And Jaguar uh, Land Rover went back and, did, did a big redesign for and ever came up with the design and they haven't announced it, haven't shown it. There's no concept, haven't seen it. Jerry will just tell you that you're going to like it, but it's also going to be polarizing. Finally, and this maybe this is the real reason the new Evoke took precedence in 2018. Though diehard Land Rover enthusiasts will cringe to see the Defender potential launch in the 70th anniversary year, one up to buy its antithesis in the lineup, the high volume Range Rover Evoke is now seven years old and due for an update. While nostalgia and tradition are good, the Evoke pays a lot of the bills these days. So that could that may actually be the number one reason, I think, more so. Well, they, they had the Evoke to deal with. They had to come out with the new Velar. They keep coming out with all kinds of other stuff to uh, occupy their time so they don't have to worry about the Defender. Okay, I'll, I'll throw in. Since it's I'm a being, procrastination since, technique. Yes, yeah, oh, exactly that. Um, since I'm being grumpy guy tonight, I don't think he's in that hurry. Their sales are up. They're making money. All he can risk by putting one out there is that people don't like it, and he risks his what little reputation he has and whatever else is going on. So it's like, why? I mean, and in this weird way, why do it? Why? Why push it? Because, yeah, I get the sense that Jerry really doesn't want to do a defender. Yeah, I think I think if to. I think sort of if if the world sort of wasn't making him, he wouldn't do it at all. I mean, he I'd wants almost to forget about that just, part of the company, yeah. I think. I'd almost rather him say that, that we're just not going to do it. I'm going to disagree. We, with we're you. no longer a tractor company. We're not doing it. Well, I'm going to disagree with you all. I, a, of course. Well, A, he does not, he's not the final say in whether they're going to do it or not. But I, I do think that the, it's a, the important part here is that the newer vehicles, especially the Evoque and the Disco Sport, are making money for the for the company, and so you're going to focus on your money makers. And the Defender never really made a lot of money for the company, so therefore, I don't think it gets the attention for that reason because it's money making operation. As much as we love it and we like it and it's iconic and right. we want one, it's not the money maker. It's, it's not right, the and and the sales results enable people to drag their feet with the Defender. Right. So if, I don't think something they don't, don't want to do that is justified. You're, yeah, really. I think you're agreeing with us. No, I, no, no or you're just no. making our point for us. No, no, no. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 th you're, I think it's the way you're coming. You didn't, you didn't, you were saying. No, I'm saying Jerry wouldn't. No. I don't, I think the company would like one. There's lots of people within Land Rover who would like one. Obviously, the community does. I think if Jerry had his druthers, we oh, wouldn't be I, talking about it. You can I, see it putting his face when some reporter I, asks. I, him. I agree with you. If, I agree with you. If Jerry was in, <laughs> if, was in charge of the company, I do agree with you. If Jerry was in charge of the company, he would probably have cut the Defender and moved on because it's it's new 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 Year's new design. I give you that completely. But Jerry is not fully in control of the company, and yeah. while he may Th thank well, God it's not the McGovern Motor Company. Yeah. And while he has a certain say in things, he is not the ultimate decider on these things. I don't think he's dragging his feet. 
and even if he is dragging his feet, it doesn't matter because there's you know, there's uh, the engineering people, there's the finance people, there's management, and they're all saying, you know, you need to get this done. And he's maybe he has said or in consultation with the marketing folks because they have, I think they've you know good marketing people is let's focus on this, let's focus on this, and we'll line these things up instead of having everything come out at once. We're going to do it over a period of years or months or whatever it is. What I disagree with, I guess, is putting all this on McGovern. I don't think it's all on McGovern. That's what I disagree. With. No, I mean, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll. I'll buy your your premise there. I don't think it's all on McGovern. But I think McGovern, you know, he, he I, I believe that he would rather not do a defender. And so if he can come up with good reasons and sell them to others why the defender is not ready yet, he, he's going to going to do that. Yeah, there were there were other reasons, as I said, listen, this article that he has nothing to do with, like the where it's produced, the factory, the architecture and platform it's on. So that's, that's... well, the architecture and platform argument, I, I could fully buy that, that he's because I really think that when it does come, it's going to be drastically different. And that technology may just not be ready. I mean, if is if my prediction holds that there's going to be a totally all-electric one, maybe this stuff isn't really able to be produced yet. So so he's delaying while the world catches up to what he wants if he's got to do it. I, I, I'll disagree with that, too, because I believe they've been testing a lot of those things in the current models over the last couple of years with active with their terrain response too, and some of the other things that have been going on. They've, they've probably used them as mules and, and you know, well, I think platforms. so. I think they've been testing about, I'm oh. not sure they're quite yet ready for prime time and it, and not, not all together, all in one thing. And I think when those all pieces come together, I think that's, that'll be the new defender. Sum up and this article as it, it does his, according to a presentation to investors in June, the new defender is due to launch in the 2020 to 2021, when you get that right, physical year. Yeah. And a reveal in late 2019 is likely, a reveal in late 2019 is likely. Testing has begun. Drive, sure it is. Driveline test vehicles with hacked up Range Rover sport bodies have been spotted in England. Uh, they seem to ride higher than Range Rover. And one of the rigs has had some relatively meaty tires. So it's come together. And then the other article mentioned that they're thinking that it might be the earliest that they might reveal the new Defender would be April of next year, because that's when the new physical year begins for a Land Rover. Right. And it's coming in 2017. No, it's coming in 2018. No, it's coming in 2019. Now it'll be a 2020 model. Uh huh. Just keep counting up. <laughs> Moving on, uh, I know this is a Land Rover podcast, but uh, there was a review of the 2018 Jaguar E-Pace, and Roadshow did this. I'm just going to read you the good, the bad, and the bottom line. If you want to read more, go ahead and do it. The reason talking about it is it's a... Or find yourself a Jaguar podcast somewhere. <laughs> or start one. I don't know. I've never really checked. Is there a Jaguar podcast? Well, it probably that I know is. of. Yeah. No, not that I know of. The good. The 2018 Jag E-Pace looks sharp. Smart design details drew me in. It's fantastic handling and great power won me over. The bad. Tech annoyances, including park distance sensors that simply didn't work, made the E-Pace difficult to trust and live with. The interior looks nice, but some parts like paddle shifters feel cheap. Bottom line. Uh, Jaguar's playful 2018 E-Pace is an extremely stylish and fun little luxury SUV, but inconsistent and at times unreliable tech make it hard to recommend over the strong competition in this class. So that is a turbocharged four-cylinder all-wheel drive Jag E-Pace, uh, five-passenger capacity, starts at 38600 American. So you'd be better off buying an Evoque, in other words. Probably. Or maybe a used Disco Sport. Well, there you go. Yeah. All right, we'll move into some events. Uh, event report from the Money Chef Challenge. And this is thanks to our friends at Atlantic British. So this was the Money Chef Challenge. We have it on the show before. The Atlantic British team arrived on site Thursday, got set up. They spent they were visiting with the neighbors and getting the lay of the land. Important information like where the showers were. <laughs> Friday morning, they woke up and prepared to head out on the trails. A great group of guys from near and far uh, went out on local class four roads and were close to the event site. They had some mechanical issues, but they were remedied on the trail. After the ride is when Money Chef got extremely interesting. The summer's weather in the Northeast had been bone dry or super stormy. This day would be the latter. And as they headed back to camp, the sky turned black. The winds picked up. The lightning and rain came. Apparently, well, that makes for fresher mud at the Muddy Chef. Yes, I think that, yes, the, the muddy, the mud in Muddy Chef was there. So, How are you supposed to make mud pies without it? <laughs> All right. 
There's, it, you, I'll let you uh, go out and check the article. We'll have a link to it in the show notes if you want to read more about the Money Chef Challenge. So that happened. was uh, Oh, it was in July. It was late July. July 26th through the 29th in Manchester, Vermont. And then they also attended the Western National Land Rover Rally. And that was September 13th through the 16th. And it was in Bear Valley, California for the second Land Rover, uh, excuse me, the second Western National Land Rover Rally. That's a tough one to say. It was a weekend of off-roading, camping, good food, team challenges, a raffle for one awesomely kitted out 2004 Disco 2. The WNLRR is organized by four of the regional Land Rover clubs uh, hosting Northern California Land Rover Club, the Arizona Land Rover Owners, High Desert Rovers, and the Great Basin Land Rover Club. The first event took place in Sedona, Arizona. The event lasted for four days. Guided rides on local trails showed off the majesty of Northern California with something for everyone, from stock trucks to heavy-duty rigs. And there's a little more. I'll let you read that out on uh, our website. You can get a link to it over at Atlantic British for the Western National Ro- r- r- Rally. And there is a apparently there is no firm public information yet about a, the next WNLRR, but there is one planned. That would be the third. Mar is also coming up, first weekend of uh, October, which actually, by the time you listen to the podcast, it'll probably be the very upcoming weekend, uh, and we'll be down there, so say or hello. perhaps you'll be listening to it on the way to Mar. Yes, yes, yeah, say hello, and uh, I will be happy to show off the Defender to you if you want to see it, just to ask. I'll be happily do that. We'll and it's there. awning? Yes, I will. I Yes, I am taking the awning. The awning will be deployed. Very good. Indeed, sir. Indeed, awning deployed. Isn't Morgan attending something upcoming? I forgot to write this down. I was rushed right before. Yeah, the... he, he's going to the VOR, I think. That's it. That's it. So by the time this comes out, he probably will have been to the VOR. Stop and say hi to Morgan if you see him. And a thank you to a friend of mine who, unbeknownst to her, has sent me a lead to uh, an interesting overlanding trip that took place in a Land Rover. It's called a Grizzly Torque. And this is two Canadians, 19 countries, and a 1957 Land Rover Series 1. They call it the Grizzly Torque. And so this were two Canadians. They drove around the world back in, I think, the, I think it was the late 50s, uh, maybe early 60s. And my uh, friend of mine just happened to post it and, and said, have I seen this? So I looked it up. There was a video of it, uh, Land Rover produced. And there was a couple accompanying articles. And I'll, we'll have links to those, of course, in the show notes. And uh, so it gave us a, it's a really cool looking series one truck. It's based on a, um, it's a long wheelbase series one. It was extensively rebuilt by Pilchers, the coach works, uh, who they special, they had specialized in converting ambulances uh, for military use. The chassis signature front end and four wheel drive running gear uh, remained intact, but now included were two built in beds. They had uh, some beds, they had a uh, portable stove, a couple jerry cans, uh, painted with gin and tonic, where we've seen that before. Gee, wonder how they <laughs> thought that one up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Foster Video chronicled the adventure. They traveled back to the UK for the first test drive of the Grizzly Torque and learned how to maintain and repair it, uh, which sounds very familiar, does it not? Uh, yes. Also had a, it was a pop-up too. I was looking for that here in this article, but I believe it was a pop-up and uh, so that you could stand up in it a bit so that was it was that kind of like long long wheelbase ambulance looking thing they had two cots in them uh, that popped out from the side so i reached out to both of the the drivers uh, bristol foster and robert bateman and they did this 60 years ago and i got in touch with uh, bristol foster he is going to be a show a guest on the show in an upcoming episode Great. if you want to know a little more about it Go out and check our uh, link to links to the two articles in the show notes. Very cool. The the artist painted on the side of the truck, uh, like when they went to different countries. So he ended up painting like a little scene representing the, the, that. You'll see that in the photos. I get the impression they restored this. It's I mean I read the article and it wasn't I don't know maybe I skimmed it too quickly, but it seemed like it was it was restored after a period of time. So and I'm, I have no idea where Grizzly Torque comes from, but that's what it's called, Grizzly Torque. Mm-hmm. Twisted bear. Well, hopefully here in the near future, we will be talking with Bristol Foster. And finally, this has nothing to do with uh, Land Rover specifically, but it, I think it's, it might give you some inspiration to do astro tourism. So there are resorts, parks, and attractions in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and other places around the world that are expanding the galaxy that was become known as astro tourism. So they've set aside areas that are designated as International Dark Sky Parks. And there was an article in the New York Times. That's where I saw this. There's a, a, nothing Land Rover specific, but it might give you a reason to go out in your Land Rover, do something interesting, no matter what version you have. 
and maybe track down one of the international dark sky parks in your neck of the woods and uh, go check out the, 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 you know, what's above you, the heavens above you, see the stars. Something, something to do while you're overlanding too. Both a reason to go and something to do. Yes. And I would, unsolicited, I'd recommend downloading on your pad or your phone, mobile phone. They have, there's uh, apps, like the one I have is Starwalk. And that will allow you to see what the what stars and planets you're looking at. You actually can hold it up to the sky and assume you have a signal. I think I think one of them may work without without a signal. It may have enough information to do that on its own. But it, most of the time, I think it needs a cell signal. But you can do like a augmented reality mode where it it's, you see the sky behind you, but at the same time, it overlays it with you know this is uh, you know this is Mars and the Moon's here and the Sun would be here you know through the, if you're looking through the Earth the Sun would be over there so that's kind of a neat stuff so with, with like moving trackers like like a NASCAR telecast yep yep cool some of them at least the one I have you could if you want to look for a specific satellite you're looking for the International Space Station or you're looking for a specific star you can say where is you know Cygnus 61 and it'll take you there it can also show you the constellations because I never could figure out what constellations were I always knew the Big Dipper and that was about it but this one as you're moving over you're like, oh, that's Leo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. So, yeah. So, go out and do some astro tourism in your Land Rover. I think that'd be cool. And that's the news for this Monday. Our guest this month is Dan Greck of The Road Chose Me. We learned about Dan from a video of an off roader traveling through Africa. And he was uh, talking his way at the, through the border checkpoints and never having to pay any tribute. Or maybe a bribe. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty good. Check it out. I have a. I'll try to re- find it. I got to track it down, and we'll get a link to it in the show notes. Hopefully, he's overlanding in a jeep, but his story is one of adventure and exploration. And I think a topic that we all seem to connect with. He lists on his website a number of miles he's driven, the countries he's been to, and even the cur- country he's currently in. And we talked to him about uh, two, three weeks ago. Now you can follow Dan's adventures at theroadchoseme.com. Joining me now from the continent of Africa is Dan Greck. Dan Greck is traveling o- o- overland, and he has a website called The Road Chose Me. Uh, welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you, John. It's a real pleasure to be on. You are a special guest. To my estimation, you are the first non-Land Rover adjacent podcast guest. So Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor. I uh, I feel like I've got big shoes to fill here. I, I better not mess up. That's oh yeah, absolutely yes. Yeah, don't screw up. It's only a it's only a hobbyist podcast. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're... <laughs> and the reason why uh, Dan is uh, I'm calling him out on this is because Dan is not driving a Land Rover. Alas, you were driving a Jeep, and uh, so t- so tell us, Dan. Uh, well, let's start off. Let tell us about the Jeep. So you know what? Uh, just a little bit. Then we'll get. Then we'll go back into your talk about your story. But let's get the elephant out of the room and tell us a little bit about your Jeep. For sure, I'm driving a 2011 Jeep Wrangler Rubicon four door. So it's kind of the the biggest uh, Wrangler that they've ever made. And because it's the Rubicon, it's got factory diff locks. It's got low range transfer case. It's got a stronger front diff. Where is it made? Is that a is that North America? It is North American. Yep, okay. it's Canadian spec. So it's a three point eight liter V six gas engine and a six speed manual transmission. Runs on maple syrup. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And poutine, yeah, not, di- not diesel. Interestingly, yeah, which is uh, controversial for Africa, but yeah, not diesel. Right. You think diesel's expensive um, in in the U.S. compared to gasoline? It's even more expensive in Canada. That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's a it, and so it's a Canadian spec uh, Jeep Wrangler. You know, for <laughs> all my years of living in the U.S., which is most of them, but I live uh, in near Pittsburgh, uh, which is uh, mm-hmm. people on the podcast know that, of course, but they also know it's the ancestral home of uh, of Jeep because uh, in Butler, Pennsylvania, uh, which is about an hour north of uh, Pittsburgh, is where the original uh, Bantam Jeeps were created. And the Bantam Jeeps were produced, designed, and then as a result from that became, uh, during World War II, they became Willie's Jeeps uh, when they lost the contract, or some say stolen, the contract was stolen from them. And then it became Willie's Jeeps, and the Jeeps that everybody knows. 
So in many ways, Jeeps were, you know, are, are around, from around this area. You would think I'd know more about them. I don't. So <laughs> uh, you, you know a lot more about them than I do. That's for sure. I know about historical uh, stuff. Uh, am I allowed to ask, have you ever driven, have you ever owned? Owned one yourself? I have not owned one. I did years ago, uh, geez, when I was um, uh, just out of college, and you know, you're thinking about your first car and all that stuff. Uh, I did drive one. Uh, did drive a Jeep. It was a Wrangler, I guess. Is that that's the sport? That's the the off roady one, right? Right, the, exactly. Yeah. It's the the Defender, I guess. You know, the right. the kind of doors off, roof off, solid axles. Yeah, this one, that's exactly what this was. In fact, I, I remember i remember taking the test drive, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, this is my son's. It's got lifted. It's this. It's got big tires. Hey, let's – and we you know, take a little test drive. Hey, let's go off-road. And he had a little course, and okay, that's oh, great. Wow. As much as I would love it now, then, no. <laughs> it was not like – right. not for yeah. a daily driver. You know, it was – Oh, you know. I mean, terribly impractical. Oh, not, yeah. not really very useful in, in, like, the vehicle sense of the word if you, right. if you need to commute or – you know, even carry your kids or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. And I was like kind of surprised that, you know, I was like, no, no. Then years later, um, you know, I ended up, uh, uh, ended up obviously getting into, into Land Rovers. And then now I own it. Now I have a Defender and I have a Series 3. And, you know, it's a whole different story. Now I'm like, well, because I, you know, you know why? It's because I have the a nice, good, modern car that I can go to that if I do want to take a long trip or just don't want to deal with all the BS, you know, you can jump in it and go. All right, let's go back to you. So you're, uh, where are you from? It sounds like you're Australian. Yeah, I'm from Australia originally, John. And then uh, I moved over to Canada about 15 years ago. So now I'm based in the Yukon, way up north. So you're 16 years old. <laughs> Next birthday, I'll be 18. Actually. <laughs> oh, there we go. Good, good, good. Wonderful. You can drink in, I think, three provinces, uh, something like that. Yeah. Something like that, I think, yep. yeah. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> 19 in uh, Ontario and I think I think it's 18 in Quebec. So yes. I think so, yep. I have uh, I have a number of friends from Quebec, so I'm, I'm familiar with uh, with 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 the province and well, good part of Canada too. Okay, so you're from uh, you're Canadian, Australian, something along those lines. How I, I you know, based on your website which is theroadchoseme.com, uh, you've taken two large uh, overland expeditions and of course that's why we have you on the show. You're currently in Africa, you're in Zimbabwe, right? Actually, I've just driven into Zambia just uh, last week, so you Zambia need, right now. You need to update the website. Come on, man. I, I'm on it. I'm editing photos. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the job at hand. <laughs> uh, but your first journey was a Pan America trip where you went from uh, Alaska down to uh, Argentina. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was uh, two years through 16 countries. Sounds about right. Tell us how that started, because apparently that was your first journey. So what was the what was the genesis? How'd that happen? Right. So uh, I, I'm actually an engineer, um, a computer software engineer. So I sit at a desk all day. And basically, I, I was doing that for years and looking out the window every day at the sunshine. And, and I just thought to myself, I don't want to be in here. I want to be out there. So I started dreaming and planning and, and, uh, and I wanted a, a good solid four wheel drive and, and being in Canada, you know, what, what's available, what's easy to get your hands on is, is a Jeep. Uh, and so I bought a little Jeep and, and then sort of put this big plan into action and I drove all the way up to uh, Prudhoe Bay in Alaska at the end of the road. And then I turned around and, and drove all the way south down to Argentina. And the trip just sort of evolved and grew as I went along. It, uh, it wasn't necessarily planned or, or like strict timeline or anything. It was just let the adventure roll and see what happens. Did you go by yourself? I did go by myself. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't find anyone that was crazy enough or <laughs> had any kind of savings account to come with me. So I just decided it, it was better to go by myself than not right. go at all. Sure. Did you do any research ahead of time? Any any or, or do any you know uh, pr trip preparation? Uh, or did I, you just kind of? I was on a really tight budget. And so I didn't modify the Jeep at all. I didn't have a winch. I didn't have big tires. I didn't have a fridge because I wanted to put all of that money as gas in the tank. Um, and for research, I, I did a little bit of reading around and other people's blogs. And, and so I knew it was possible. You know, I, I could cross all of the borders. And then that was about as much research as I did. I like it. Sit your pants. That's wonderful. It's kind of the only way that I know how to do it. Um, I find if, if I try to plan too much, I just get way too stressed out and and it feels way too overwhelming to think, you know, I have to drive through all of these countries and that's really hard. So instead, I just sort of take it one day or one week at a time. Cool. And you and you did it without a GPS. 
That's right. I had no. Uh, I mean, that was that was in two thousand and nine. So the the iPhone had barely been invented. So I had nothing electronic at all in in that regard. No navigation. So did you use maps? Uh, I did. Yeah, paper maps the whole way, yeah, which wow. uh, in Central America worked really well and and was kind of fun because there aren't really that many roads. You know, in North or South is sort of easy to figure out. But then in South America, it got really stressful. Some of the big cities, like it, it took me four hours to drive out of Quito in Ecuador, just one city, because it was so massive and I was so lost. Wow. The, the only the only tricky part about figuring out north and south is that you know, you're you're driving towards the sun for a while, and then all of a sudden, then you got to change it up and drive away from the sun. <laughs> so, what was the big thing you learned out of out, out of that trip, Dan? Like, did you uh, was it was it you you know? You, it sounds like maybe it was you needed a GPS. <laughs> <laughs> or was, or that was, was one something? of the things I learned. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I learned so many things. I think it, it changed me. I'll never be the same person again. But I, I got addicted to overlanding. I got addicted to meeting new people, learning languages, eating new food and, and seeing new places, you know, and, and exploring down tracks that, you know, I have no idea where they go, but I'm just going to go and have a look. That type of lifestyle or that, you know, type of exploring. And so... Basically, as soon as I got back to North America, I started saving money again. I knew that I wanted to do this again in my life. And so started saving money and dreaming and planning and uh, getting ready and, and hoping that I'd be able to make it happen again. And you, and you did uh, by because and now you're in Africa. Exactly right. Yeah. So that was that was the big sort of dream. And for years, it was just far away on the horizon. And I had no idea how I would ever get there. And then slowly, slowly, the savings account built up and and this trip I did plan a lot more for, and I did prepare the vehicle a lot more. Uh, and so it was years in the making, but but I made it happen. Yeah, there's a you have a nice uh, explanation of all the the build that you did on your Wrangler uh, on your website. Uh, that's a that's a nice part of the of the page, by the way, explaining everything you have and what you did, and uh, and, and just and some degree why. Like that's how I learned. Of course, you didn't have a GPS. <laughs> Why not maybe more extensive to uh, trip of or like circumnavigate uh, South America or you know or Asia for that matter? Is there any particular reason why uh, Africa is it just the seems like the complexity level is probably the highest next to what probably Antarctica? <laughs> yeah, uh, I met a couple in South Africa and they were driving around the world. Um, uh, sorry, South America and they were driving around the world. And after we'd hung out for a couple of weeks, they, they kind of saw the type of adventures that I really enjoy and the, the really get off the beaten path, like as far away from civilization as is humanly possible. And after a couple of weeks, they just said, you know, Dan, we really think you would love Africa. And, you know, and you have to get there ASAP because it's changing and it won't be the same forever. So it's like, hurry up and get there while you can. And then so ever since then, it was kind of planted in my mind of like, oh, that, that sounds like a pretty big adventure. Like possibly the biggest adventure I'll ever be able to find. Do you know what they meant by it's changing? Does it just Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah, I've seen it myself. There are cities are growing unbelievably fast and it's it's way more developed than than kind of you would think or than people would have you believe. And so a really good example is there's this famous road from Cameroon to Nigeria and it's about 100 kilometers, so 60 miles of mud mud mud. And it's really famous because you can't drive it in the rainy season. And even in the dry season, there's, there's people take a week to drive 60 miles because the road's that bad. And it's the only road. It's the only way to drive West Africa. And it's part of the reason, actually, I chose the Rubicon with the diff locks and, and kind of all the four-wheel drive goodies. And then by the time I got there in 2017, the road was paved. And it's, it's a freeway now. You can drive it with cruise control. And, and so that wow. kind of thing is happening all over the continent where – these, these roads or these places that were really famous for being difficult or remote, they're basically just highways now. It's amazing. Is that from uh, Chinese investment? Almost all of it is Chinese. Yeah. You see the huge road construction crews, like hundreds and hundreds of pieces of heavy machinery, thousands of workers, and they're just smashing down the jungle and building these huge big freeways, wow. usually so that they can extract resources. So then you see all the trucks coming past, you know, loading with ore or with wood or whatever it is they're taking. I'd heard, you know, you hear anecdotally that that's going on, but I I didn't realize it was happening, I guess, that quickly. Yeah, it's it's amazing how fast it's changing. And, and I think we from the Western world, we can't really grasp it because our world hasn't changed that fast. You know, like the internet's pretty new, but 
for the most part, cities, they're just sort of bigger versions of themselves. Or, you know, you might remember when a particular road was gravel, but it's now paved. But we're talking about going from like the worst road you've ever seen in your whole life to a four lane freeway. Wow. It's like that's that, that that's big. Well, that's because so, our rape, our rape of this continent, and uh, was done a uh, hundred years ago. That's right. Yeah, we've we've sort of done all of our development. We have electricity and running water and and three G internet that right. all got done. So now we're just sort of on this even keel. Whereas Africa right now is in the big boom, they, like the huge you know slope on the graph. They have catching up to do. Exactly right, and they're doing it unbelievably fast. So just wow. just to recap that, so that was a a sixty mile road that previously yep. you could only travel in dry season, and it would take you a week. And it, within a matter of, I'll say, a year or so, you can now travel it at uh, at, at in an hour. Uh, That's right. Uh, <laughs> in a, in a yep. passenger so you car, can, you can look it up on YouTube. Actually, it was called the Mumphrey Road. It's M A M F R E, I believe. Uh, and there's a few videos that Overlanders put on there, like in the early 2000s, and you're know, like they're getting dragged through mud pits with heavy machinery, and yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it was I was looking forward to it. I was hoping it was going to be one of the highlights of the whole West Coast. But so they're no no longer famous for their mud, huh? Not in that particular spot, no. And so I went looking for it elsewhere. <laughs> and did you find it? Uh, I didn't find mud, but I found unbelievably remote border crossing. Uh, the, the border guard there said he'd been working there for three years and he'd never seen a foreigner in his whole life. Really? Wow. Wow. That's so it's, so it's still possible. If, if you try hard, it's still possible to get like really, really off the path. So what are some of the highlights then of, of, of Africa that you've traveled so far? That, that definitely has been a highlight. Uh, that was a border crossing from Nigeria into Cameroon. Okay. And it was, uh, yeah, really remote, really friendly people just – you know, you, you walk into a town and, and people come running out of their houses to shake your hands and say hello just because they want to say hello. And then further south, I drove through the Congo, the, the big one, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, uh, and again, I tried hard to I went on a route that's probably only been done a handful of times by uh, overlanders. And that was a week of mud, mud, mud and no infrastructure or development, unbelievably remote and rural people who, again, are, are smiling and happy. But it was, that was, I think, the furthest I've ever been, you know, into the wild in my life. And it was, it was really, really full on. Uh, I traveled with some other overlanders and they nearly rolled their vehicle. So we had a, a tricky <laughs> extraction to get them out. And then um, we crossed the Congo River on a ferry that was the most ramshackle ferry I've ever seen in my whole life. I honestly didn't know if it was going to make it across or not with our two vehicles. I mean, it was fine, but it was uh, it was basically like a few steel drums and some sheets of steel welded onto a big engine. And uh, yeah, so right so crossing the crossing the Congo was also an amazing highlight. So, how many Land Rovers do you come across? We you know got to have a little bit of Land Rover content. Uh, local Land Rovers or foreigners driving Land Rovers? You, you answer, answer, yeah, as, answer yes. as you see fit. <laughs> or both. Uh, local local Land Rovers. I've actually been surprised that there haven't been as many as I was expecting mm -hmm. in in West Africa. Anyway, uh, they they are here and there. I would probably say I see may I saw maybe five per country. Usually Defender One Tens. Sometimes back to Series that are still putting around. Um, definitely Land Cruiser Seventy Series is is the vehicle. They they outnumber every other vehicle hundred to one. And then foreigners driving Land Rovers, definitely. I bump into them from time to time. You know, the, the 110 is, is one of the best vehicles ever to drive around the world in. There's no doubt about that. Um, but then now in, in southern and east Africa, they are becoming a lot more common. There are Land Rover dealers all over the place. You know, South Africans love them and drive them all over the place. Uh, and so I've seen a lot more of them in, in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and now Zambia. Yeah, we, we know a lot about South Africans who love Land Rovers. <laughs> yeah. Have you yeah, they, ha have you met them they yet? Love to travel. Have you met the Bells? I haven't actually met them face to face, uh, but we do exchange a lot of emails online, and and I'm sure we will cross paths at some point. Well, you know, their next destination is Africa, so, and they, I guess they're going to return home, and uh, maybe 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 your paths will cross. Then I give you good reason to meet up. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll be excited to see which route they take and uh, and where they go exactly. I I'm always fascinated to meet people or, or chat to people who are driving West Africa because it's not a very common route and and so there's kind of not too many people that have done it. I think they they they've put a sketch up on their website of their one of their tentative planned routes, but they never follow those really all that exactly. <laughs> so that's only for guideline purposes. Okay, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, I, I believe it is West. I believe it is West uh, Africa that they were anticipating uh, the the route they were going to take. I think for the reasons you mentioned, that not many people go that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and my understanding is they've already traveled East Africa quite extensively, so I'm sure they're right. looking for for new and exciting places. Yeah, they well, you know, as you know, they're from South Africa. They had gone up into uh, Tanzania, I believe, and they did like the eastern side of Africa as a kind of a test run. Did that for maybe what three or four, six months, if I recall correctly, and then that's when they ship had their vehicle shipped over to to South America. Yep, I think they might have even done a couple of shakedown trips. Right. Yeah, maybe there was maybe there's one or two, but immaterial. Uh, am I right in thinking that the difference between in, in Africa, if I can generalize it, and I realize that's difficult for you know the uh, extremely large continent, uh, but is the eastern side more deserty and the western side is a little more uh, tropical, or is it is that also a north south issue? I think that's mostly a north-south issue okay. because you know the North equator Central. cuts right through the middle, right. and so I, I'm not there yet. I'm I'm not uh, in the jungle on the east side, but I think whenever you're near the equator, like Uganda, Rwanda, even parts of Kenya, it it is full jungle, just like it was on the western side. Mm -hmm. So I think it's Africa's desert in the north and desert in the south, and then jungle in the middle. Jungle in the middle, yeah. I was thinking more uh, the the West Coast route versus the East Coast route. I I just had this impression in my mind that the West Coast was more of the jungle, tropical, you know, hot mud. Mm. Yeah, I, I think you're right there because if you take the West Coast route, you you have to drive through the jungle. Right. Whereas I think if if you stay like on the coast on the east side, I think you can avoid like the mo most of the jungle. Most, yeah, I think there's some. Maybe maybe even temperate or or certainly not desert. I think on that side. The, the, the question there is: Is that a function of the uh, climate, or is that a function of development? And there's just more roads and more options yeah. on the east side. Yeah, I would say that's that's what it is. Is there are just so many more roads on the east side, and so you can really pick and choose how far inland you go, like how close to the Congo you get, kind of to to the middle of Africa. Yeah. And so if you stay away from the middle, I guess you stay away from the jungle a bit more. Whereas on the West Coast, there were quite a few countries where there's really only one road that you can take. Straight through the jungle. Exactly. And are, are there any countries in Africa that you uh, do not wish to return to? Can you name them? Because <laughs> you had a bad experience or you know, <laughs> something? I have never been to a country in my life that I wouldn't want to go back to. Um, good to hear. I, I find, you know, a smile and a handshake just goes such a long way to to having a good experience and to, you know, uh, having people treat you well. And so even in the, the really notorious ones like Nigeria or the Congo, I didn't have a single problem. I mean, a couple, a couple of kind of standoffs with the police where they wanted money and I didn't want to give it to them. But, but, you know, you sort of, you brush that off and move on and then you meet a hundred friendly locals that, that outweighs, you know, the one annoying policeman. I just remembered you're the guy who the video I saw doing that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, the video in Nigeria. <laughs> That's right. I'm like, there's this guy. That that I don't know if you hear that, but that thank you iTunes for randomly playing a song. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Thank you. Just iTunes. in case you were falling asleep during our podcast, yeah. there you go. But yeah, but you were that yeah you were that guy that uh, yeah that That's was a, right. that was a cool video <laughs> that was a, yeah you're that guy that was that was that was that was cool it was well done I loved how you kept her cool you know you just kept smiling and you you kept uh, distracting them if they wanted to see your papers or if they wanted money you kept you know hey nice country nice country you know oh, this is wonderful can I go there can I go there that was a that was a good tutorial also I would say. Yeah, bribery is a funny thing. At first, I remember being so nervous about it and so, like, afraid, you know. They've got guns and, and you know, they're big bad guys. But the more, you, the more you experience it and the more you get used to it, you realize it's kind of just this big, like, social interaction thing. And it's like if, 
if you let them dominate and like try to get money out of you, then they will. But if you stand your ground and be friendly and be firm, then they're just kind of like, oh, that's okay, brother. Have a good day. And they wave you away. Yeah. Well, yeah, I got I got the sense of that from reading the, some of Graham's books, too, that it's, it's very much a haggling proposition. Definitely. Yeah. Everything's negotiable here. Absolutely everything. And bribery is one of those things. That's good. Now, now I remember how this whole connection was made in my head. Sorry about that, Dan. But it's like, oh, yeah, you're that guy. You're that guy from that video. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it was Morgan, actually, who sent that to me and said, you got to see this. And then... Then I think we either you reached, I think we reached out to you, I think, to come on the show. We, we might have just come up with a show title. It's that guy. It's that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's that guy. Hey, it's, uh, are you going to put a hey in front of there? Hey, it's that guy. Uh, <laughs> neat. What's the, what was the most surprising country you've got, you've gone to uh, so far in Africa, that is, uh, maybe because of, you know, beauty or different than maybe you, than your mind's eye anticipated? I feel like uh, I could say that about five or ten countries, you know, different than kind of what my mind's eye would have expected. Um, but for me, uh, there, there are two three, Congos. Yeah. So the, the first one is called the Republic of Congo, and then it's kind of smaller. And then the, the big one that everyone thinks of, like Zaire or the Congo, is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so the first one, the Republic Congo, it's way more developed than I ever would have thought possible. It is extremely beautiful, really big green rolling hills, not dense jungle everywhere like I would have thought. Uh, really good roads. Uh, Brazzaville, the capital city, which is on the Congo River, is like a really big modern city. And then over on the coast is a city called Point Noir. And same thing, it has like big skyscrapers, really modern, really clean, friendly people, uh, and so that that country for me really, you know, it's it's smack in the middle of the jungle, but it's really, really beautiful and modern. And uh, yeah, that really surprised me. You said you had five or six. Any any others you wish to comment on? Yeah. Also, uh, Lesotho, which is uh, it's a really strange little country. It's mm. basically is that surrounded by South Africa. It is. Yeah. It's an outcropping of mountains, uh, the Drakensberg Mountains, that's completely contained within South Africa. So it's just like a little circle. Uh, and they call it the kingdom in the sky because when you get there, basically, you just drive straight up. And then the whole country is really high elevation, mountainous and jagged mountain peaks that, that definitely get snowfall. Uh, and the people there are probably the friendliest people I've ever met on the continent. And they, a lot of people live a really simple life. They, they uh, tend to their, their cattle or their sheep on horseback. And they live in these um, circular stone huts with uh, straw roofs, and they they kind of they live a simple life, and they are so happy. They smile from ear to ear. They're always laughing. They're always joking. Uh, and Lesotho was one of those countries I really had this vibe that like people absolutely will go out of their way to help you just just because they're nice people, just because they want to. It's it's not that big either. I'm I, looking at the map. I. I know it's surrounded by South Africa. I don't know the size. Yeah, of it. yeah, it's kind of like a little zit in the middle of South Africa. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And <laughs> and it's kind of funny because you, you sort of think like, oh, is it even a separate country? But it absolutely is. It's it's entirely separate. You know, there's proper border controls with immigration, and oh, okay. they use separate money, and it, it is a totally separate thing. Hmm. I I always thought it was like maybe a protector to South Africa. I never really checked into uh, all the you know the official details, but that's. I, we look. We, we've learned something new. New knowledge expanded here on the podcast. Yeah. Well, let, let's hope they never do anything to piss off South Africa. Well, actually, uh, they are one of the few countries. You know, back in the day, the Zulus kind of ruled all of Southern Africa, and they couldn't take Lesotho. They tried, but because it's mountainous, it was really easy to defend. And so the locals actually basically fought off, you know, the Zulus, and then they held out and would not become part of South Africa. Yeah. So in I fact, like, I, basically they, they won that war when it happened. But I think with modern technology, they wouldn't be able to defend it quite as well as they could before. That's true. I think they'd be in a world of trouble. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's the next thing you're doing? Where are you going from here? Are you circumnavigating Africa? Is that the plan currently? Uh, I would love to, except that the the top of Africa right now, the northern section, is uh, fairly wild and off limits. Yeah, so, especially Libya. <laughs> right, Libya is a really big problem right now. So I'm I'm hoping I can get into Cairo. That's 
current plan is kind of to end the trip in Cairo. Okay. And while I'm there, I'll do a little bit of research about can I maybe ship the vehicle to Algeria or Tunisia, or is is there a remote possibility of driving across Libya? Um, I doubt it, but I, I'll do some research when I get closer. Right. That would be kind of cool to say that you uh, circumnavigated uh, Africa. I'm sure you'll... You, right. That was yeah. the dream from the very sure. beginning. And, and back in kind of 2010 or, or earlier, that's basically what everyone was doing. That was the really common route was mm-hmm. to cut across the top of Africa there. But then since the um, the Arab Spring, it's all become off limits. Right, right. So how long have you been on the road then in Africa? It looks like uh, seven, almost 800 days now. That's right. Yeah, it's been just over two years. And and you anticipate how much more time? How long is a piece of string? Yes, exactly. <laughs> how long is your piece of string? I, I guess I always, I've, lately I've been saying it'll be finished at the end of this year, so another four or five months. No. Um, but that might turn into five or six months. Yeah, you but never know. I guess soon. Like I, I feel like the end is in sight. Okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. I noticed uh, from your pictures, you don't take many spares with you. Do you have any trouble getting parts, and and do you have many breakdowns? Have you learned to become a mechanic? Uh, I'm a I'm a backyard mechanic, I would say. Well, you are an uh, engineer I'm good by at trade, right? things and then bolting new things back in their place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in terms of you know bush fixes, I, I wouldn't say I'm I'm very good. Uh, and actually, the Jeep has been amazing. The Jeep has never let me down. And it's only had a few minor little things that haven't been difficult at all or, or not showstoppers. And getting parts definitely would be a big problem. You know, if I was in the jungles of Gabon, it would be a, I would have to hitchhike to some town and I would have to try and get DHL parts from the US. Hmm. So I would it, think, I would think that's where having a Land Rover would come in handy. I think the parts availability would be much better for you. Definitely, yeah. It's a, it's a big difference, yeah. Land Rover or Toyota, you, you'd be able to get parts locally, and and you'd find guys who'd know what to do. You know, oh yeah, they've they've seen this before. Whereas with the Jeep, it is just a big unknown quantity. Are you a unique individual then in Africa, like because you have you are driving a Jeep? I'm fairly unique, but yeah. it, it kind of as it turns out, there are two other American couples who are driving the East Coast in Jeeps. Oh, cool. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. So it's like. I don't know that anyone had ever really tried it in a Jeep, and now suddenly there's three of us at the same time doing it. <laughs> you led the way. Uh, how much uh, electronics are in, in your Jeep? Is it, I assume there's maybe some sort of like uh, electronic control module, but maybe that's about it. Oh, no. Um, unfortunately, the Jeep is extremely computer controlled. It oh. actually has 11 separate computers. Wow. Um, you know, yeah, it has, you know, the engine control unit, the powertrain control unit, which are kind of the two, you know, big ones. Without those, you're not moving. But then, right. you know, it's got ABS, it's got traction control, it's got stability control, it's got, got everything. I forgot what model, what year model was it again? I'm sorry. It's a 2011. Oh, okay. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, very yeah. computerized. Yeah, definitely, right. yeah. definitely. Yep. Yep. So it's pretty new. Uh, you might, if you'd gotten something from the 90s, you might have gotten away with something that only had five computers in it. Yeah. That's right, exactly. My last one that I drove to Argentina, it basically just had, you know, the, the one computer, the, the ECU. Right. Oh, okay. So it's not the same. It's not the same Jeep then. Okay. No, so, it's a different Jeep. The, okay. the one I took to Argentina, it was a little two door, and and I couldn't sleep in it. It was too small and it had nothing. No fridge, no solar panels, no winch. And actually, I sold that one in Argentina, um, and it was a great vehicle. I really loved it, but it did teach me that I really wanted some creature comforts. You know, I wanted some interior living space. I wanted to sleep better. I wanted to cook better, and then so. I dreamed and planned, and, and that kind of helped me to design the next one. So, so that was only a one-way trip in that Jeep. Exactly right. Yep. <laughs> how'd you, yeah, get, and it, how'd you get back? You, uh, I flew back. But okay, right. It's funny, you know, you, you drive to Argentina and you think, like, that's it, I've done it, I've done the hard part. And then you try to sell your vehicle and you're like, oh, okay, this is the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> they, have, uh, they have really high import taxes down in Argentina and Chile. Uh, and really, really strict importation laws. So it's it's not easy at all to try and sell a vehicle down there. Can you cut it up and sell it as parts? You could definitely do that. Uh, you could try and have it declared as a wreck. You, you know, There's a few loopholes like that, but you're probably not going to get much money for it. Um, and so in the end, I found a loophole and I sold it to another foreigner 
who he basically just has to take it out of the country every three months and bring it back in. So it's only, you know, in inverted commas, it's temporary in Argentina. Right. So, so you're, the, you're current. there's always loopholes for things like that. But if you tried to put Argentinian plates on it, it would cost a fortune and it would probably take a year. So your current Jeep then, my apologies, I realize now that's two different Jeeps, but your current one is a, it's a six speed manual. It is. Yep. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I'm looking, I, I, I really do like what you've done with the, uh, with the build part uh, on your website. I, it's nice. It's clear. Uh, gives a sense of what you're doing. Uh, I'm always fascinated by this. So, so what's your solar panel setup? I've got two 100 watt, uh, Renergy panels on the roof and they, they're permanently mounted on the roof, which, which I personally think is the only way to go mm -hmm. because it means no matter what the solar is charging, you know, before I even get out of bed in the morning, it's charging. Or, or if I'm parked in a town and, and shopping at a street market, you know, it's charging. So I think having to have panels you get out every day and put in the sun, I think that's, uh, you know, not the way to go. Um, I, yeah, think so it's, I, I think it's better for the longevity of the panel, too, to have it permanently mounted. Yeah, the people I see who get them out every day, you know, all of their cables are frayed and kinked and, and don't look like they're going to last very long. And, and the panels are bouncing off each other and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I've got the two panels and then they're wired through a Renogy charge controller and then two uh, Optima yellow top batteries. So one solely for the engine and then one kind of for all my accessories, like the fridge and the water pump and things like that. Smart move. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of the, you know, the standard dual isolated batteries set up. Right. Oh, so that's what a Yukon license plate looks like. Okay, I was wondering <laughs> what license plate that was. There's an, you know, I was like, okay, that's a Yukon license plate. All right. You're looking at the one on the back with the, yes. the guy gold panning? Yes, yes. It's, I, it's funny, you know, things like that. You don't realize it until you go international, but like that license plate doesn't say the word Canada on it. So right. as soon as you get to a different country, people are like, what's Yukon? Like, they've yeah. never heard of it. And same goes for my driver's license from Canada. It, it barely says the word Canada on it. So it's, and the registration for the Jeep does not say the word Canada. So it's kind of interesting, you know, you show up at borders and they're like, yeah, but where's it from? And, <laughs> I mean, it could be, it could be anywhere and they wouldn't know any different. Right. My, my mother drove all over Europe in the eighties with, in a car with Minnesota plates on it. <laughs> That's awesome. So she got the same kind of blank stares and yeah, all yeah. all the U, all U.S. Uh, driver's license and uh, and license plates are all based on the state. Yeah, Pennsylvania, uh, you know where where we're mostly in. You know, it says Pennsylvania on the right. plate. There's no nothing right. indicates the U.S. Your license just says Pennsylvania. Doesn't indicate the U.S. at all. Yeah. The, uh, well, the only thing is, for a while there, the Pennsylvania plates across the bottom said uh, www.state.pa.us. Oh, oh yeah. That's tr well, okay. There we go. So you'd have that much to, to identify it. Right. Gives it away a little bit. A little bit. So is that a, uh, a, a gas tank then on the rear of the Jeep that's uh, in between the, t the tire carrier or part of the tire carrier? It is, yeah. That's uh, good eyes on that one. That's a tank made by a company called uh, Titan Tanks. And it's, uh, it's a 53 liter which is 13 gallon uh like they call it a transfer tank mm -hmm. and so you can fill that up straight off the gas pump and then it comes with a siphon hose to move it from there into the main jeep tank that's really cool mm -hmm. so that means i carry about uh 40 gallons i think it is in gallons 40 gallons of gas okay. and so my range with that on good roads i can do 600 miles and then that goes down a lot on bad roads. So maybe only 400 miles when the going gets tough. You have problems getting uh, f good fuel? Uh, I haven't had any major problems. When I got to the Republic of Congo, they had turned off their one and only refinery for whatever reason. <laughs> and so actually I drove into Brazzaville, the capital city, and the gauge was lower than I've ever seen it. I, I fully expected to run out, actually. I was turning the engine off at every red light. Uh, but got to where I was going, got to a campground, and then started asking around. And so the locals were like, oh, no, there isn't any. Like, there's a lineup at every single station there has been for two weeks. Uh, but it's just one of those things in Africa. Like we said, everything's negotiable. And so you find someone who you can negotiate with. And I ended up paying 10 US dollars a gallon to buy uh, about 20 gallons. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. 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 And one of the, it came in two jerry cans and, one of them looked pretty good. It was nice and clear. And the other one had a whole bunch of brown floaties in it. Uh, and I just thought, oh, well, so be it. Yeah. 
Have, have you uh, learned to change fuel filters? <laughs> you know, the Jeep, it, and, and I'm, uh, I'm going to get uh, a lot of uh, bad vibes for this. The Jeep only has a filter in the tank on the pump. Really? And I, oh, I, didn't yeah. actually, I didn't actually install a second filter. It's, it was on my job list for so long that somehow it was one of those jobs that never got, a, never got around to it. And so I don't have any secondary filtration on the, on the fuel, and so far, so good. Do you have a funnel and a coffee filter? You can strain what goes into the tank at least. Right. I do have like a, a Mr. Funnel uh, that has like a filter built into it. And so okay. whenever I fill up from a, from a bad jerry can, I do pour it through that. Yeah. I was going to say a coffee filter works pretty well, actually. Yeah. Or even, even through a T-shirt or something I would do if I had to. Yeah. But I think, too, because it's, petro, because it's gasoline, the engine, I think it's a lot more forgiving than if it was diesel. Uh, I've bumped into a lot of people that have had real problems with bad diesel. It's usually I always thought it was the other way around. I thought diesel was more forgiving than the gasoline. I think if you've got an old mechanical diesel, that's probably true. Mm. But I think these days, you know, most of the diesel engines, they want their low sulfur and, and they really get unhappy if there's any water content in the diesel. Yeah, the newer stuff is picky. You're right. So you said, of course, I think the gasoline engines are pretty picky too. So I don't, I don't know if it's any better with gasoline or not. Maybe just diesels come up to the gasoline pickiness. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, what kind of engineer are you by trade? Uh, computer software, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> another IT guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, yeah, and okay. an IT guy that doesn't really want to do that again. Yes. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, that's it's... right. How many of us just say, like, nah, don't, not doing that? Uh, all of us on the podcast have a computer background, either currently or in the past. <laughs> that's funny. That's that's fine. Okay, case so I thought maybe like because well then my next question I thought maybe that informed my next question which was did you do all the work yourself figuring oh I'm you know I'm an, a mechanical engineer electrical engineer but so uh -huh. then you're, I did I did all the work myself except for the welding uh, I'm terrible with a welder I can stick things together but that's about it uh, and so I convinced a few friends to help me there and then got a hand a few times but yeah I did as much as I could myself. Nice. It, it looks good. I like the setup. I, I, as I said, I really enjoyed the uh, looking at what you did to your build and gave me some ideas myself. Like I said, the the fuel the fuel canister and um, I think your your food setup too was uh, you had. Uh, what am I looking at? The the cooking stuff that comes off the the other your kitchen area there. That was pretty nice. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and actually, the inspiration for the whole inside was a Defender One Ten because the Defender is. I mean, it's. It's a full foot longer. It's almost a foot wider and almost a foot taller. So in terms of like being able to sit in the rear area, the, the Defender 110 makes so much more sense than my Jeep. So you sleep on those boxes that are in the back then? Is that, your, is that, is that the bed or does that form this, the support for the bed? That's a, a secondary option. I, I can sleep down there if I need to. Uh, but the main bed is up on the roof. So the whole, oh. I replaced the standard roof uh, with an aftermarket one and the whole thing opens up at like a 30 degree angle. And so the entire, the entire roof of the Jeep is a bed. Oh, I thought it was just like a Land Rover doormobile that popped up and then gave you a headroom and you would stand. Right. Be an but you're saying there's a new roof and then you. Well, it is. It's actually both. So mm. the company standard makes it, uh, it's just a bed. It's like a roof. But I had to modify it and we cut it out and I moved the roll cage of the Jeep. And so it can operate either way. It can be like a dormobile where you can stand up and walk around. But then there's, there's a mattress sections and kind of a, a concertina setup where you can then make a sleeping platform upstairs, as I call it. So you can, <laughs> you can do both. Nice. That, no, that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Kind of like the X Pandas then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And th those vehicles are where I got all the inspiration from. And I realized I wanted to have both because, you know, when the weather's horrible or when the mosquitoes are bad, it's so nice to be able to go inside and just sit in where it's warm and dry and read a book or just something to sort of help your headspace. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that interior space is actually one of the best features of the vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's yeah. kind of interesting. It's kind of a full circle type thing. You're using Land Rovers as your inspiration to prototype the build on your Jeep. And of course, Land Rovers were prototyped from a Jeep originally. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? How how much we all sort of like get inspiration from each other and, and get different ideas and say like, oh, wow, I really want that and then find a way to make it work. Yeah. 
Well, and that's why we had you on the show, too. I mean, you know, you're driving a Jeep. I realize this is a Land Rover podcast, but you're doing cool stuff in a cool place, and you did some nice things with it, and, and it's uh, it's nice having you on the show, Dan, talk about your experience and tell us what you did because a lot of stuff is translatable. You know, you've, you've turned into a, what we call a doormobile, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, I think that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so as well. Like, a trip like this, I mean, the vehicle is, it, it is there every day, and it is really fun, and, and it is our hobby. But at some point, it, it sort of fades into the background, whether you're driving, you know, a Jeep or a Land Rover or a Toyota, because it's not the most important thing on any day. It's like you jump out of the vehicle and you, you shake hands with people and you buy street food and you look at a beautiful waterfall and, and you know, you're trying to navigate and you're trying to cross a border and all of those things. I mean, that's why you chose to do the trip and that's why you're there. And the vehicle's fun and they're, they're really fun to talk about over the campfire, but it's not really the point. And so I really enjoy meeting people that have different vehicles and different ideas because we can all learn from each other. You have a website that covers everything that's going on. And I assume, well, not, not just assume, I see you do. You have a couple books that have talked about your experience. So uh, this is the push push product part of the podcast. <laughs> so because, uh, you know. We're getting because you know, I know what you paid us to come on the show, which was nothing. Um, <laughs> so tell us about the website, what people can see there when they go to the website, and and how they can learn more about your your trip. Right, yeah, um, my website is theroadchoseme.com, and I post there twice a week all my photos, all my stories, every border crossing, all the paperwork you need, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then also I've got social media under the same name, so Facebook, Instagram, YouTube as well. I'm filming the trip. Uh, that's all the road shows me. And then uh, I've just published my first print book, uh, and it's about my Alaska to Argentina. And uh, that's called The Road Shows Me Volume 1. Uh, and that's available on Amazon as a print book or a digital download. Outstanding. Yes, I'll, I well, apologize for not reading the book ahead of time. Oh, no, no worries at all. It, uh, I really I tried hard. It's not just like I went here, I did this it's got a whole bunch of the lessons that I learned and the important sort of perspectives that I gained. Cause I feel like for me, that's what the trip was about. Yeah. That was uh, sort of the, the thrust behind Graham's books too. Of course they did it the other direction. They went Argentina to Alaska, but, yep. but I mean, a lot of the, the first book certainly was about planning for it and, and everyone telling them, well, you have to take this and you have to take that and don't go there. And then the, the experience they have is completely opposite to that advice. And that was the interesting part of the book for me. Absolutely. Yeah. That's such a common thread among people who are really doing it. They're kind of like, we were told for years that it was going to be dangerous or it was impossible or we were crazy or, and then when you actually start doing it within a week or two, you're like, oh man, this is like, I've, I've got this, this is easy. The interesting thing is the people who did this before the internet, <laughs> those people, <laughs> they're, the, they're the ones like, that were crazy. Did, did it before yeah. cell phones or GPSs? Yes. Yeah. They were crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. That that was adventure. There's no doubt. Yes. Or before paved roads or yeah, any of that kind of stuff. Any of that stuff. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm in awe of uh, anybody who took even the, the thought about doing it. The two that, of course, that stand out are uh, the first Overland guys, and you know, in the in the Land Rovers, and then there was the um, the couple that took a, a Land Rover and went to was it Nepal and back. That was the what angels angels like these? Is that the book? Uh, strangers like angels? Strangers like angels? Yeah, that's the the, for, the foremans. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, side note, he's been to Antarctica like three times. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sar we call him Sergeant Badass. Yeah. And then it looks like you uh, have a, a a link to the Wiki Overland, which we haven't talked about too much on the show, but I, uh, it's something we should have talked about. How were you involved in the Wiki Overland? And can you tell us some uh, more about I, it? I created Wiki Overland uh, and I maintain it. I, I realized when I was driving to Argentina, like there's a ton of information that you need to know, like about border crossings or paperwork or the price of diesel and gas. And you need it for every country. And it's the kind of information that, when you're in the country, it's it's sort of obvious and it's easy. But as soon as you're outside of any country, it's really hard to get. And so I thought we we needed a way, like as a community, to be able to share all of this info and to be able to update it in an easy way. So I created a wiki. And um, it's got every country in the Americas. And now I'm adding every country as I pass through in Africa. And so it, it, it is like the guidebook of how would you go about driving into Nigeria, for example. It's everything you need to know. 
All right, I'm upset. There's no Macedonia. Come on. <laughs> Definitely, uh, there are people because anyone that wants to can update it, like right. any wiki. Was... So there are a lot of countries in there that I've never been to. You know, all across Europe and right. and Russia and Nepal, and they get updated. So yeah, there, there's a ton of information in there for anyone that wants to to set about driving around a continent. It's a wonderful to now make full circle because I, re I remember looking at this site about a year or so ago and now we know who did it and who started it and so i, I actually I, I thank you for it because it is a nice resource hey it's oh, that guy yeah. <laughs> hey it's that guy he Should keeps I showing up everywhere Dan. or change my website and have a big speech bubble that just says hey it's that guy <laughs> you can use the audio it's fine hey it's that guy oh, perfect <laughs> that's wonderful so what's the future look like uh, when you're done with africa what's your plan then you're going to circumnavigate the planet go into mars go into the moon what are you up to <laughs> i would love to do all of the above uh, but unfortunately, the bank account will not agree uh, with those plans. Right. Uh, so very likely, I'm I'm going to return to Whitehorse, uh, and I'll have to get a job of some variety, and then uh, start start planning and dreaming for whatever comes next. You know, there are IT jobs that allow you to work remotely. You know that they do exist. Yeah, I could I could investigate. We'll we'll see what comes. I've, oh. I've got a few different irons in the fire right now. I have I have some dreams and some ideas. Um, but I like to have a bunch of different ideas and, you know, I throw them all at the wall and then just wait a while and see what sticks. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll send you a couple links because I've been looking at those myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no shortage of things to dream of, of places to go, that's for sure. Indeed, indeed. You could also take a whole time to uh, circumnavigate Pennsylvania because in some ways it would take you as, as long as it would take you to circumnavigate uh, Africa because there's some really crappy roads here. And you'd have to learn a new language. Right, yeah. Several, several languages, Harold. Come on, you've got Philadelphia. Pittsburgh's completely different. Then there's that whole part that goes on to Fayette County. I could live on uh, cheesesteaks the whole time. Uh, that's only on in Philadelphia, sir. Sorry, this oh, is. Oh, is that right? Yes, oh. that's a Philadelphia thing. Mm. Yeah, we don't we don't do that. We here. don't do that here. No, we put French fries on things. Okay, yeah, I, I'm down with that. There's and a French fries and coleslaw, actually. Oh, now you're getting exotic. <laughs> There's a. Uh, no, we're just getting Pittsburghese. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> they, you take a sandwich. It's called a permani sandwich, and it's now "quote unquote" Pittsburgh style. And you, as Harold said, you take dry coleslaw, you take French fries, and you put on your sandwich in between two pieces of uh, a bread, and boom, you've got your you've got your permani brother sandwich. It's a com complete meal in a sandwich. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I could see that. I, I'd try that. I, I I like the part now where Pittsburgh style salads, where you throw maybe like a dozen fries on a salad. That's that. That's <laughs> Actually, I, I do that all the time at home. It's it's good. Yeah. Oh, I I do it. Yeah, I've done it too. I'll I'll be out of the area, and you know, you of course you don't see that on on the menu too often. And then I'll say, kind of a side of fries, and they look at you weird. I'm like, I'm just gonna add to my <sighs> salad. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Yeah. Try it, Dan. You gotta try it. I will. There you go. Have you had poutine? Oh yeah, many times. All right, good, good. Just checking. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful a wonderful uh, dish. Uh, oh, when it's fresh, it, it's spectacular. Can well, eat I, it all day. I tell you what, come back when you come back to North America. Uh, I'll take you up to Quebec. I have friends who make fresh poutine. It is amazing and outstanding. Oh, sounds great. You're now a friend of the show, so you are certainly welcome in the Pittsburgh area. You can stop and stay, and we'll help you out and all that stuff. So. Oh, thank you, guys. Appreciate yes, it. Absolutely. And uh, maybe you won't slash my tires if you see my Jeep. I would never do that. I would never do that. <laughs> no, that, no that's, uh, that'd be physical damage, sir. No way. Well, <laughs> it, it, now, it, as long as you put a podcast sticker on it. I see, yeah. And, and maybe <laughs> that, a Land Rover sticker somewhere. That will provide you insurance from, from the from the tires and the windows being smashed yes. and such things. The Land that's Rover a good God, idea. The Land Rover gods will be with you then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then it'll break down, won't it? It might, it might not. You never know. It depends. Yeah. It might, it might leak a little more. It might leak. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 it leaks already. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. It is American after all. That's right. Dan, thanks very much for coming on the show. We look forward to following your adventures on theroadchoseme.com. Thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure. Have a great day. 
And that's the show for September 2018. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks to folks for helping out. Thanks, Harold, for coming on. And thanks uh, to Michael for coming on also. Thanks, gentlemen. Ten bucks is ten bucks. Michael, you're JustBritish.com. Tell the folks a little more about JustBritish.com. JustBritish.com, your home for all the British car news that's fit to print and everything else from classics to modern stuff, Land Rovers and Jaguars to MGs and Rileys and everything else. So come on by. Cool. And you uh, have a nice listing of all events going on in North America. So you can check that out if you're interested in a uh, British car related event. You do a nice job of keeping track of all those. Thank you. We try. And if if anybody out there knows of other events, please send them to us. We try to be a good one-stop shopping center for all event listings uh, to get people out there and see in these cars and trucks and vehicles and he's also the clicking noise you hear someone typing that's michael i have no idea what you're talking about you should, you should have done it you should have went click and that would have been people could hear it I, I still deny it was me okay click click plausible deniability click click and thanks to the click. one true packs for his production support <laughs> click 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 Thanks to Alloy and Grit for being part of our Wilkes Toast giveaway. We appreciate their their support and helping out with the show. Uh, visit our website, centersteer.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's show. We're also part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out the other shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Send us an email if you like. You can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer, just like Dan, Terry, and David have done in the past month. Thank them for supporting the show. If you're not a subscriber to the show through a podcast uh, app, please do so, and you can get the show sent to you automatically. Patreon subscribers also get early access to updates from the bells, and by the time you read this, the, a bell episode should already be posted up. I'm waiting for PAX to process it so I can edit it and get it up there. A month after those expedition updates are posted, they become available to everyone, so Patreon subscribers get them a month ahead of time. We we'll also have something special, Harold and I've been discussing having something special in the works for our Patreon patrons coming up, something interesting to do or to, to see in here, actually. It's going to be a visual, I think. Uh, videos and, and And it will be nice, and you will like it. <laughs> and they can just click on the link? If you're coming to... And it will be appealing, and they will like it. And it will be coming next year or the year after. And it will be polarizing. If you're coming to Mar, be sure to say hello. I'll be there, and I will be happy to show off my rebuilt one tag. Thanks for listening to show number 66, and I hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. You may now resume your important things. Click, 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 click.